Miami is this beautiful, complex collision of cultures and stories and life. There's just no other place like it. When we moved from Atlanta here to plant the church, we didn't know what, what we were going to experience. But at the same time, the promise of what God could do here was something I was like, okay, Lord, only you can do that. From the 60s to mid 80s, Miami experienced transition spiritually, socially, economically. The church started leaving. Truth started leaving too. And that escape left the sour taste in the mouth of a lot of people in South Florida. The need for not a church, but multiple churches coming together to seek the well being of the city that people would fall in love with Jesus is great. Where we are is on the east side of town, and so it's, it's Little Haiti. It's a community in transition. There's this artistic vibe, but at the same time, you have people who are extremely poor. It makes living here beautiful, but challenging to some degree. When you walk into our church, we're singing the same exact song in multiple languages. And people in our church are saying, thank you for singing in that language. That's my heart's language. That's the language that I dream in. And when you walk into our church, it is amazing that there's yeah. Bolivians and Peruvians and Colombians and Venezuelans sitting on the same row. There's an international route here that you're just not going to escape. When you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, you are helping to shape South Florida with the gospel. You are literally also shaping the world because this area doesn't just touch this area, it touches different parts of the globe. Jesus brings all of those pieces together, all of those stories, all of the people into a new family. And to see God provide things that I didn't even know that I needed, I still am amazed that he's providing the way he is. Good morning. All right, welcome to chapel this morning and our Last day of our uh, student revival. I am extremely excited to have uh, a Pastor Jimmy here from uh, my home church. And I can honestly say uh, very few people have uh, impacted my life and family life than Jimmy. And I trust that uh, he's going to really bless you guys this morning. But uh, this morning I want to um, remind us first of the Annie Armstrong offering. We are still at uh, $457 with a campus goal of $750. So I would really encourage us all to continually, prayfully give to that. And uh, I'm going to, and um, I want to introduce him for just a minute, and then I'm going to pray, and then the band will come, and uh, we'll worship together. So Jimmy, he is, um, he's from uh, Morristown, grew up there, and then uh, he graduated from Carson Newman University, and then went on and graduated from Southeastern. He is a church planner and church leader at True Life Church, which is in Jefferson City. As I said, this is where... I grew up, it is his first time on campus, and I know he is eager to get up and preach, as he always is on Sundays. Uh, and I also vowed to myself, before I come up, there'd be no stories, no nothing, so I will leave it at that, because I know what could happen if I start anything. So, um, there was no prayer request in the box this morning, um, but uh, Scott Brasher, an online student, he requested prayer for both himself, as he's having kidney surgery, and for his granddaughter, as well as she's expecting to be born here before too long. So let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, I come to you this morning. God, I thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for the chance to be here and to be set aside for the study of your gospel. Lord God, I pray over Jimmy this morning that you would um, anoint his words, and I pray that you would touch our hearts with a fresh message from you. God, I pray that you would um, be here in the service. God, let us not walk out of here the same way we walked in. Lord God, we love you, and we give you praise this morning, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, can you believe today is the last day of meetings? No. It's gone so fast. So I've been uh, blessed to, to lead worship for uh, Brother Charlie Goodman this week. 
Last night I got something very important from the service. Last night was the last day of meeting, which means people said, oh, last day of revival. No, it was just the beginning of revival. So tonight is a last day of meeting, but also the beginning of revival. Make sure that you take it out with you wherever you go. So let's stand up together and we're going to worship and praise. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no
That's the only name is to be praised, isn't it? 
as we're going through the time of prayer right now, I want you to, to think about how amazing God is. We listened to Dr. Holly last, last night uh, preaching about thankfulness. Just like you, I just like to praise for the same old things. When they look good and feel good to me. Or when they're very tough or very hard, I don't know what to do. Is that the meaning of praise? The bottom line is praise is something that we do. That's what we call to do, to praise and worship God. And we do that through obedience by following everything he commanded. Feel free to come up here to pray if you need to. If you don't, just come and praise God. Thank him for, for everything. But one thing last night, he said, be specific. Praise him for your health. Praise him for your spouse, your wife, your, your husband, your family. He even said, pray for your spiritual gift, your spiritual life. Pray for your material things. Do you ever think about the heaters? you have in your house, the AC, the fridge, the food you have on the table, because I can tell you right now, sometimes I'm eating here at my, at my house, but I'm also thinking, in Haiti, some people starving at the same time. At least that's a reason for me to thank him for providing food on the table. Just praise him and pray. Be thankful. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his death on the cross through which I'm redeemed. What's a gift? What's a blessing? It's amazing the fact that you, you say that I'm chosen. I'm called to be your children. Why me? The only thing I can thank is to thank you. Thank you for being amazing. You've always been so, so good to me. <laughs> when I look in one glance, try to figure out what my life is, and I realize that my life is nothing if you're not in it. Therefore, thank you for my life. Thank you for each and everything you give to me. Thank you for providing education for me. Thank you for giving me a family. Thank you for giving me a wife. Thank you for giving me a job. Thank you for everything. But especially thank you for called me to be a Christian. Thank you for saving me. I pray that you keep me in this path of righteousness. Give me the desire to always grasping for your word. Always following you wherever you may call me to follow you. Thank you for Clear Creek. Thank you for this place. Thank you for all those wonderful people you put in our lives to, to help us grow, to help us be the best Christians we could be. And we quickly figure out the best Christians is the one who chose to be obedient and follow you in spirit and truth. Thank you for that. 
this is amazing and we're always going to be grateful for it let's sing amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see that all Grace is so amazing. It's just overbearing. We can't even handle it when we think of the how deep, how wide, and how strong it is. We always like 
man, it feels unworthy. <sighs> but the, the blessings and the, the, the hope is that you chose us. We didn't choose you. You called us. We didn't follow you. You called us to follow you. Even if we can't understand, we can't comprehend it, I pray that you help us remain faithful to this path because it's the path of righteousness. This life, we've learned quickly that all we have to do is fall back but get back up again and follow you. As we have this burning desire to follow you, help us along the way because that's what you said. You will give us the Holy Spirit who will be our ultimate guidance, our ultimate companion furthermore it's the best friend because you know everything you know what we can and cannot do at the end of the day we, you teaching us that it's not about all that it's about obedience i pray that you help us be obedient to your call in jesus name i pray especially when I can point out that we did beat you in basketball twice this year. So, um, you shouldn't make jokes about basketball in Kentucky. Is that a bad start? Okay, well, I'll take my chances. Um, it is an honor to be with you. I appreciate uh, um, the invitation. Um, you know, someone asked me if I would take credit for Mark. Um, We'll, we'll give the Lord the credit. Uh, I am thankful for what God has done in his family. It's really been one of the highlights of our ministry at True Life. But I will claim him, even if that's bad for my reputation around here. Uh, I do love Mark and his family. And uh, I, I'm thankful for this school and that it's here for him and for you guys and uh, just what God is doing here. And just, uh, you know, for this opportunity to be able uh, to share with you for a little bit this morning. You know, I, I can relate to, to some of you. Um, I'll be 49 later this year, and I actually started preaching when I was 19, so this fall will make, uh, will, will be 30 years uh, that, that I've been preaching, and, and I felt like that uh, God was calling me when I was in high school and uh, kind of ran from it for a while until uh, I was a sophomore in, in college, and, um, you know, when, when, uh, when, when I felt like God was calling me, I wanted nothing to do with it. I had a different plan for my life. It was scary to me. It didn't seem like the, the kind of thing that uh, would be for me. Uh, I think some of the little old ladies in my home church were like, how's he going to preach? We've never heard him talk because uh, I was extremely uh, shy. But um, I, I think if you're going to invest your life in ministry, it, it, it's a great thing. It's a lot better than wasting your life. Uh, it, it'll be the most exciting thing you could ever do, and it'll probably be the hardest thing that you could ever do at, at, at the same time. We, we live in a world that is so full of opportunity right now, right? People talk about problems, but a, a lot of things are, are about perspective. Do we see problems or do we see opportunities? If you're going to be a leader, you need to see opportunities instead of problems. Uh, there's billions of people who need Christ. That's an opportunity. Uh, there's technology uh, where you know you can be almost anywhere in the world within 24 hours. Our church works in Honduras. We can leave Knoxville in the morning and be there by lunchtime. There's, there's the internet where you can have almost instant contact with anybody anywhere in the world. I know there's problems that are associated with that, but I think at the end of the day, it's an opportunity. I know, you know, we, we can, people want to talk about immorality and evil and all those kind of things. There's always been evil. There's going to be evil until Jesus comes back. Is that a problem? Well, you can look at it as a problem. But uh, I think God wants us to look at it as an opportunity because we're called to be a light in the darkness. Uh, one of the things that I don't have a lot of patience for, and, you know, the Lord's still working on me, is negative Christians. Uh, we have a tremendous, tremendous opportunity before us. Now, we have tremendous challenges, 
Uh, we have the challenge of the world, that uh, the world system that opposes God. Certainly Satan is fighting the work of God. Our biggest enemy is ourselves, our own flesh, uh, that we have to battle with uh, every day. But if you believe that you are called to, to, to the work of God and, and you've committed your life to that and you want to make a difference in the world, you want to fulfill God's will for your life, you want to be used by him, I want to talk to you this morning about what is our power source to actually see that accomplished. I mean, kind of the way I approached this is I prayed about what God would have me to share is kind of thought back uh, to, to when I was a student and kind of thought ahead and what's happened since then and thought, well, if I have one opportunity to speak to this group of people, what would be maybe uh, one of the most important things uh, that, that I could uh, say to them that would, would want to leave with them when it comes to, to the work of God. And you know, when it comes to our power and our power source, uh, there's obviously electricity in this room. There's, there's lights, there's sound, there's internet, there's cameras uh, that, that are running. Uh, but if uh, someone unplugged certain cords or cables, even though there's the potential for all that power, we could be sitting here in the dark with no sound and no transmission uh, of the live stream. Uh, we could walk out to our cars, and our cars, maybe you've got a really nice car and it looks great and it's all in all in good working order, but if a cable was disconnected to your battery, there's not going to be any power there, and it's not going to run. As Christians, we have a power source that is within us, but the question is, are we going to live connected to our power source so that we're living in the power of God instead of living according to our own resources and in our own strength, both in our personal lives and in the ministry that we're attempting to do for God? And the, the power source that I want to talk to you about this morning is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, when, um, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, th there's something that I like to say. If you heard me preach consistently, you would hear me say this several times, is you can fall in the ditch on either side of the road. And there's uh, certain subjects that that, I think, is particularly true of. And the Holy Spirit is one of those subjects, I believe. There are certainly... Uh, hyper charismatics and Pentecostals and you know, the word faith movement, all this kind of thing. People that are out in, in left field doing strange things in the name of the Holy Spirit that are unbiblical and are not of God. So there are people that are certainly in the ditch on that side of the road. But maybe sometimes in reaction or overreaction to some of those excesses, there are uh, people who get in the ditch on the other side of the road and that they don't want to have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're maybe kind of afraid of the Holy Spirit. I remember one time when I was a teenager sitting in church with my friends on, on, on the back row and the pastor saying that he was going to preach about the Holy Spirit that night and me having this thought, which is kind of awful, but I don't think it's isolated to me, but I thought something weird is going to happen here tonight. And I think sometimes Baptists, other denominations, kind of connect the, kind of these weird excesses with the Holy Spirit. So you can fall in the ditch on the side of the road of ignoring the Holy Spirit as well. But I believe that if we correctly understand the New Testament, that we will know that it is impossible to be saved apart from the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. It is impossible to stay saved without the work of the Spirit of God in our lives who indwells and seals us until the day of redemption. He's the one who keeps us saved. But that also, most people would agree with that, but as clearly as the Bible teaches those two truths, the Bible also very, very, uh, just as clearly teaches us that it is impossible to live the Christian life 
or to do the work of God apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit in and through us. He is our power source, and if our lives are going to bear fruit, if we're going to accomplish anything worthwhile, if we're really going to live out our faith, we're going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit and not our own strength. So, this is the, the big idea that I want to give you this morning, is that the Holy Spirit is our power source who empowers us to do the work of God. Now, let me, let me show you and, and kind of develop this idea from Scripture. So if you've got a Bible, let's go to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4, near the end of the Old Testament. And while you're turning there, let me give you a, a little background on this. But I, I really more want to focus on the, the practicalities of this as it relates to ministry today. But the background. This is the fifth in a series of visions God was giving to the prophet Zechariah. John MacArthur says the purpose of this vision was to encourage Zerubbabel to complete the temple rebuilding, to assure him of divine enablement for that venture, and the endless supply for the future glory of Messiah's kingdom and temple. The lampstand that we're going to read about pictured Israel fully supplied by God to be his light then and in the future. It must be noted that the church has temporarily taken this role presently until Israel's yet future salvation and restoration to covenant blessing and, and, and usefulness. And so this speaks to Jesus being the light of the world, uh, shining through us. This was immediately given for Zerubbabel's encouraging. It, it, it contains future messianic prophecies for Israel, and it applies to the church now. So as we read this, remember it's based on the menorah in the holy place of the tabernacle. But there's more to the lampstand in this vision. There's a total of 49 pipes with a continual supply of oil, which represented the continual empowering of the Holy Spirit that was available to them. And I think the olive trees that we read about symbolize Joshua and Zerubbabel. So with that in the way of background, let's just read uh, the chapter and what it says here. Um, it says, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I'm looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by uh, power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That was his promise. That was his encouraging to him. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, verse 7 is also very important to understand what we're going to talk about. He says, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Now, what's he referring to here when he refers to this uh, great mountain? I, I believe it refers back uh, to chapter 1, uh, verse 16, where the Lord said, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel was charged with the task of rebuilding the, the temple. And what did this assignment look like to him? It looked like he was facing a great mountain that looked impossible to climb. So hang on to that. But notice what he says. Here's his promise. He says, Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone, the, the final stone, with shouts of grace, grace uh, to it. And then he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and in verse 9 is very important as well. Verse 6, it says, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But notice what verse 9 says. It says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation 
of this temple, his hands shall also finish it. Now, I said verse 6 is very important, but I also want you to hang on to this word hands that's repeated there. Okay, his hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven uh, shall uh, rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then I answered and said to, to him, What are these two olive trees? Uh, at the right of the lampstand and at its left. And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So, the Holy Spirit is our power source who enables us to accomplish the work of God. And so as we're seeking to do the work of God, hopefully in the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to give you four principles from this text that can guide us as we do that. Number one, anything that God really calls us to do is impossible in human strength. Anything that God really calls us to do is impossible in, in, in our own human strength. Once again, verse 7. God had given Zerubbabel a promise that amounted to a calling, rebuild the temple. And it was Zerubbabel like, man, this is so awesome that God chose me uh, to do this, and this is going to be so easy, and this is going to be so fun, and this is going to be challenge-free. No, he's like, this looks like a great, mighty mountain. Now, with where you are with school and, and, and work and, and, and family and, and, and those kind of things, uh, you know, th this may feel like a mountain to you right now. Can I just encourage you and tell you to get used to it? Because if you're going to serve the Lord, that's where God wants to keep you for the rest of your life. For, for at least two reasons. One is, it causes us to be dependent upon Him. And two, whatever He does through us, He wants the glory from it. Not the glory for us. You know, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me... And brings forth much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things that we can do. But what I'm saying, if God has really called us to do it, if it's really going to be fruit that glorifies Him, if it's really going to have eternal value, it is something that is beyond us. I, I believe that in our lives and in our ministries, God's calling us to do something that's beyond us, and that stretches us. And then he calls us to another step that's beyond us, and that stretches us. And then he calls us to another step that's beyond us, and that stretches us. And all the while, that's how we're making progress, is he's putting things that are bigger than us out in front of us. And then he grows us into what he has for us in the future. Um, you know, we, we planted True Life about 16 years ago, and, and since then God's used us to plant other churches out of True Life. You know, I think planting a church is something that's impossible, and, and, but when God calls you to do it, then he gets the glory for it because he's the one that came through. Uh, but, you know, the thing about it, when, when I was at Carson Newman or when I was in seminary, I had no idea that God would call us to plant churches. And... Uh, the, the thing about it is you're probably sitting here trying to figure out your future and how's God going to use me and what's my future going uh, to look like and who am I supposed to be? And can I just tell you that um, while those are important questions and you need to be seeking God, you don't know what your future is going to be today because in part you couldn't handle it. 
Because you're nowhere near who you will be and as strong and as equipped you will, as you will be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. So, but um, if, if you stay faithful and keep obeying and do what God's put in front of you now, uh, and then you take the next step and the next step and the next step, there's no telling what God can accomplish with your life when it's all said and done. Second principle is this, is that God's empowering is available for everything that he calls us to do through the Holy Spirit. God's empowering is, inv- is available for everything that he calls us to do through the Holy Spirit. It, 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 it looks like a mountain, but God said he would bring it about. So he's going to flatten that mountain. He was going to empower Zerubbabel to do what he was called to do. But how is he going to do it? It wasn't going to be in his own strength. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, if we're going to overcome, if we're going to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish, if we're going to climb that seemingly unscalable mountain, it's going to happen as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we are filled with the Spirit, as we walk in the Spirit, as we trust, obey, as we claim uh, the promises of God. It's been said that if God calls you to it, He will see you through it, but He does that by His Spirit. And so, you know, when, when I look back at... Uh, our lives and, 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 and our ministry and, and, and what's happened. You know, I, I see things that I, you know, I would have never anticipated happening, things that, that God has done. But I see it that it's the good things that have happened, the ways that God has used us, it's been by His Spirit and certainly not in our own uh, flesh. Uh, Charles Feinberg, in his commentary on Zechariah, has, has pointed out that, you know, in, in Scripture, that oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and here's some of the things that oil symbolizes and why the Spirit is so important to our ministry. Oil lubricates. Oil heals. Oil lights. Oil warms. Oil invigorates. Oil adorns. Oil polishes. And in some sense, in all of those ways, the Holy Spirit is working in us to shape and form us and transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ and empower us more and more to do what God has called us to do. So, if God calls us to do something, it's humanly impossible. But for whatever God truly calls us to do, he empowers us to do it by His Spirit. And, and, and let me just, one thing before I move on to the last one. Uh, let me just point out again that God had promised and called Zerubbabel to do this. God empowers us for what He's actually called us to do, not what He's called somebody else to do. L- listen, w- one of the things that's a temptation in our social media age is to look at somebody else's life or somebody else's ministry and covet it. Right? I mean, I mean it's easy to think. I, I've certainly done this over the years. Is, God, why aren't you using me like you're using that person? But the thing we've got to remember about uh, Instagram or, or what, whatever is, is that we are seeing the filtered version of somebody's life. We, we're seeing the posed version of somebody's life. We're we're not seeing the real down and dirty of the details day in and day out. We're not seeing the price that they've paid to to be where they are. We're not seeing uh, the the demons and the spiritual warfare they fought to be used by God in the way that they're being used. And sometimes we can want to be somebody else. We can wish that we had gifts that, that some other people had. You know, I, I wish I could sing and play an instrument. I wish I could have, uh, you know, had those gifts and could do uh, what these brothers and sisters were up here doing. 
But listen, the only musical request I've ever gotten at True Life is to make sure I have my microphone muted during congregational worship. That's not my gift, and God's not going to empower me because that's not what he's called me to do. God empowers you to do what he's called you to do. Don't worry about being somebody else. You just develop into everything that God has called you to be. Take what he's put in your hands and use it as faithfully and as fruitfully as you can for him. Because this is the last principle that I want to give you. And this is really important. I talked about hands. That word hands. Hands. And that is the spirit empowers us as we obediently do the work of God. The Spirit empowers us as we obediently do the work of God. Now, I talked about earlier, we can fall in the ditch on either side of the road. I think that's true with this issue, too. Um, you know, sometimes as, as Christians or some Christians, I mean, they're, they're real active, they're real doers, and, and it's like, you know, they're always doing something and, you know, expecting God to bless it. Uh, other people, it, it's like, they're a little more, uh, you know, devotional, maybe a little more mystical, so to speak, and they're like praying, and they're just kind of sitting back, waiting on God to zap them, and waiting on God to make something happen. And can I just tell you that when you read the Bible, uh, both of those are ditches, but the road that God wants us to be on is not either or, it's both and. It, it, it's to seek him, it's to pray, it's to trust him, it's to be in his word, it, it's to be walking in his spirit, but it's also to be actively obeying him, serving him, sharing the gospel, using the gifts that he has given us. Listen, God empowers us as we put our hands to the task that he has given us. He empowers us as we do the work, not before we do the work, and not instead of doing the work. Listen, here's how we want it to work. We want God to empower us and bless us and answer our prayers and give us everything we need and then we'll go do it. But the reality is, is that God answers our prayers and provides what we need as we take steps of obedience. Listen, faith isn't a feeling. There's people that are spending their lives waiting on God to do something because they're waiting on getting some feeling before they act. The Bible teaches us that faith is obedient action. Faith is taking God at his word and acting on it. And as we take a step of faith, that's where we experience God's presence, power, and provision through the working of his spirit. I mean, listen, we felt like uh, we, we, were, we were living in Maryland. I was pastoring a church there. We felt like God called us to come back uh, to Tennessee to plant a church. Well, um, you know, there's a lot of things you need to plant a church. But here's the thing. If we would have prayed about it and waited until God gave us what we needed to start the church, we'd still be waiting on the church to start today. There wouldn't be True Life Church. There wouldn't be the other churches that have been planted out of True Life. But when we put our hands to the work in obedience to what God had called us to do and, and, and seeking him and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit as we did what he called us to do, then he provided. You know, our, our church, uh, we have a church planning ministry in Honduras. And one of the things that we've been able uh, to do there, uh, the the lady who is the executive director of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America in our county has gone to Honduras with us, and she's kind of exported the Boys and Girls Club idea to Honduras, and we've been able to start nine Boys and Girls Clubs in Honduras. Can I tell you that for 
zero for none of those clubs did we have the financial resources that we needed when we agreed to start them. Listen, you can wait forever or you can hear what God is calling you to do. Trust the power of his spirit. Put your hands to the work. Do what he's called you to do and watch him provide as you do the work. You say, well, how do I know what uh, God wants me to do? Well, you know, what are your spiritual gifts? What, what do people affirm in you? But, you know, more than anything else, just grab what God puts in front of you. If, if, if God gives you an opportunity, take it. And then out of that, he'll bring another opportunity. And the Bible says when we're faithful in little things, He'll make us ruler over much. He says in this text, don't despise the day of small beginnings. While you're a student, do everything you can. Get all the experience you can. Serve the Lord in all the ways uh, that, that you can. And out of that, you'll figure out where you're gifted and where you're not. And you'll see what doors God opens. And you'll build relationships that he'll use down the road. And there'll be ways that he'll lead you. Don't worry about 30 years from now. Just be faithful right now and trust God that he's sovereign, that he's got a plan for your life, and he's working out that plan. Let him connect the dots. You're not supposed to have it all figured out yet. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to listen, do what he's called us to do. We're supposed to obey, put our hands to the work, but not relying on ourselves but admitting our own inability and relying on the power of the Spirit of God. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit, says the Lord. So, to, to conclude this and to help you apply it, I, just want, I want to leave you with two words that hopefully will stick with you and be a guide in the days to come. One is stewardship. Be faithful and obedient with what God has given you. Put your hands to the work. Be a good steward and claim his promise that if you're faithful and little, he'll make you ruler over much. That's how God's going to raise you up. That's how he's going to prepare you. That's how he's going to guide your life. And, and, and the other word, or maybe it's a phrase that I, I would leave you with, is spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.18 Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Galatians 5.25 If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The way to live the Christian life, the way to serve God, is by being controlled by the Spirit of God. He indwells you. He lives within you. But are you submitted to him? Are you relying on him? Are you looking to him? You know, as you abide in Christ and you spend time with the Lord, are you asking the spirit to fill you, to control you, to lead you, to empower you, to sanctify you, to grow you, to, to change you, to give you the wisdom you need, the love that you need? Are you relying on him? Or are you relying on yourself? The Holy Spirit is our power source. Let's live connected to him. Can we pray? And I encourage you, as we pray this morning, to ask God to give you the grace that you need to, to be a good steward of what he's called you to do. And I encourage you that if there's unconfessed sin in your life or something that's hindering you in your fellowship with the Lord, to ask Him to forgive you. And I encourage you to ask Him to fill you with His Spirit. And I encourage you to make a determination that you're going to rely on the power of the Spirit and not your own strength in your life and your ministry. 
Father God, I thank you for this time and this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for um, all the students and faculty and administration here. Father, I pray that you bless and use this school and uh, just provide for all of its needs. Lord, we pray that you would raise these students up to being men and women of God, mighty warriors for Christ, that you would send them out uh, to the four corners of the earth to make disciples of all uh, the, the nations, to serve you, to be used by you, to, uh, to plant churches and to pastor churches and to lead in churches and to, to spread the gospel and to minister in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the power of your spirit to be upon them, uh, to bring that about. Lord, I pray that uh, you would fill us with your spirit, that you would help us to be faithful, that you would give us everything that we need, or you have given us everything that we need. Help us to use what you've given us to be everything, to do everything that you've called us to do. Lord, make our lives fruitful for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.